This is Dance Is Us, a series of podcasts produced and presented by Sveen Malta during the COVID-19 crisis. The program aims to highlight the myriad ways dance features in our lives, reminding us that everyone has a relationship with movement and everyone has an experience of dance. It's also an opportunity to draw on the opinions, ideas and perspectives of the many voices in our cultural ecology. We've been talking to dancers and choreographers, as well as artists working in other disciplines, policy makers, curators, writers, directors and thinkers. The theme of leadership provides a back backdrop for discussion this week. We're asking our dancers and peers what leadership, in particular effective leadership, means for them. And as we forge a new place for dance and the arts more broadly during COVID-19, what opportunities for adjustment will arise and how might we reimagine leadership? So today I'm very happy to welcome Teresa Beatty to our conversation. Therese is a dance consultant based in London and her expertise spans organisational development, recruitment, evaluation and research and all specialising in the, in the field of dance. Her background in the UK includes working as a curator at Southbank Centre and the Royal Opera House, as Director of Artist Development at The Place and roles in Arts Council England. Her current clients include Akash Odejo Company, it's been multinational dance company, Dance East and Airwaves, which is a network of partners across Europe, enabling choreographers to bring new work to new audiences. Therese is also development associate for Res Centre Research Centre at Middlesex University. She's a trustee at Hoffa Schechter Company and Curious, and also an advisory board member for Kerry Nichols Dance. So, Thank you for agreeing to join us today, Teresa, and welcome. Thank you, Nicole. It's lovely to be here. Teresa, I'm starting each interview with the same question, which is, can you tell us your earliest or most vivid memory of dance? Uh, it's more a memory of movement, which is uh, when I was at primary school, um, we used to do music and movement, which was a radio program for very young children. So this is when I was about five. And um, you'd have to do things like imagining that you were a tree um, or a mushroom, that sort of thing. So that's my, that's my earliest memory of um, taking part in organised movement. Do, do you, was there any particular object uh, that you enjoyed? I, I remember the tree. I remember the, the tree was a bit of a recurring theme, <laughs> and we did it in in the, the school hall, which also doubled as the canteen. <laughs> so the floor was always a bit dubious. <laughs> I've got a great image of, of what that might have looked like. <laughs> um, can Teresa? Can you explain? In the introduction, I described you know what I, I sort of gave your bio and your background but can you tell us what you do as a dance consultant what is a, a day in the life of the Teresa Beatty? Yeah of course I mean um, I've been working freelance as a consultant for about 14, 14 years now and I think in a nutshell what I do is I help individual dance artists and organizations of different sizes to fulfill their visions uh, and to work out what the visions what the vision is um, and that's very much informed by my background as a curator and a programmer and a lot of time being in the studio with makers um, while they're making and at different stages in the process of getting a production um, on stage mm -hmm. um, so i work with people in a very individual way every you know every client is different in terms of of what they need but planning is always an important component um, uh, an example of how I'm how I worked on planning with one company um, was that for example we had huge rolls of pa the paper that you use that you wrap carpets in so it's absolutely huge and we mapped out all of their ideas on this. And then I wrote it up and that's because they, they were very visual learners and they needed to be mobile and they needed to crawl around and put stickies down and, um, you know, and things like that. It needed to be a tactile uh, kind of kinesthetic um, 
process. Um, I rarely work with anybody who thinks in a linear way, so I'm constantly trying to find creative and imaginative ways to uh, to draw people out. Um, in my recruitment work, which is something that has come into my working life probably only in about the last four years. Um, again, it's very, I work in a very bespoke way with organisations to help them recruit to senior roles, so exec director or CEO or um, artistic director. And that's very much working with them to, um, with the board in order to crystallise what the role is that can be particularly complex and challenging when um, the person who is uh, leaving and moving on to new opportunities is a founder because you actually have to work out what they do <laughs> because they're so much a part of the organization and you also have to think about what the organization needs now and what it will need in the future so the process of crystallizing into a job pack can be, it's a bit like an iceberg, the job pack is the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. sort of thinking um, underneath that. And then I um, look for prospects, advertise extremely widely in order to get as great a diversity of uh, strong candidates as we can, and then support the organization as they need through the um, interview process. Mm -hmm. Um, then uh, evaluation is um, a, a sort of key area of my work. I usually have a couple of evaluation projects that um, are on the go because I tend to work with organisations over quite a long period to evaluate an area of activity. And that can be, it's, it's always evaluating it for the organisation. I do it in a very iterative way so that if I'm working with them for a couple of years, I feed back on the findings at regular intervals so that they can apply them as we go along. There's no point waiting till the end and then telling people what your recommendations are, um, in, in my view. And also evaluating activity which has been funded by, for example, a charitable trust or foundation, which has very clear criteria and objectives and their own evaluation questions. And they want the project looked at um, through that particular uh, frame. And evaluation is about making the case. So what I see myself as aiming to do is to equip the organization with the evidence and the arguments that they need to make a case for valuable activity to be supported and uh, in the future so that it can happen again and be enriched by the learning from, uh, from the, the iteration that I uh, evaluated. And of course, that's also about making the case for financial support. Almost everybody I work with ha is in receipt of public money. Um, so you've obviously got to be absolutely responsible about how that money is spent and about providing evidence for how it's being spent and the impact it is, it is enabled to happen and, um, and its efficacy. And that brings me to the final area, which is fundraising, which is, I think, a part of anyone who's ever been a producer, <laughs> anyone who's worked in the arts, um, has been involved with fundraising. And it's certainly not a major part, I would say, of what I do. But there's always a strand of activity, which is about that. Um, so recently, I've been helping a, a couple of artists here in, um, in the UK with applications for emergency funding from Arts Council England. So we're very fortunate here in the UK um, to actually have emergency funds that people can apply to, which is certainly not the case um, everywhere. So you're, you're this incredible repository of, of knowledge and information in the field. It should be bottled out of <laughs> Teresa's knowledge base. Um, She's something I, I would also like to mention, which is very important, um, very important to me and draws on my experience of working at the place where running artists, the artist development department, I was doing what we called surgeries, um, which were one hour sessions with individual artists looking at their, uh, their development. Um, 
and in a small way I now carry that on through mentoring I'm not a coach um, people I work with like to call it mentoring it's up to them what they want to call it um, and that's where I work more with uh, individuals sometimes artists sometimes executive directors uh, on one occasion somebody who very recently become a CEO and they hadn't had that um, that role before and that's very much looking at um, the issues that they bring to the table but very frequently those are around managing time managing lots of different um, priorities being in the heat of the furnace that can be a making and um, creation process and the the emotions and feelings and practicalities around organization and logistics and finance that cannot come up in those sorts of um, uh, situations and achieving a work-life balance that is right for that individual um, at that time I definitely don't pretend to have the answers but I enjoy listening carefully and I aim to listen well and a lot of what I do is reflecting back people know their own answers but um, I know from my own life the value of having a sounding board so I enjoy doing that for other people. Can we can we reel it back to just learn a little bit more about you and tell us where you grew up what were your aspirations growing up and, and what eventually drew you to this career in dance? I, I grew up in uh, Hertfordshire, which is a county um, just outside London. It's about 40, well, it's probably about an hour from the very middle of London. So it's fairly nearby. But certainly when I was growing up, it, um, it could have been hundreds of miles away because it was, you know, it was a small village. Yeah. Um, and uh, going to London was something quite special. So uh, it, it felt quite separate at that time. Um, and uh, aside from being a tree and being a mushroom at primary school, I, um, I started ballet probably when I was maybe 10, um, I think. And that was because I'd I suffered from bronchitis, very heavy kind of, you know, lung, nasty coughs and colds and lung things. Um, and suggested to my parents, it'd be good for me to do something that was a bit cardiovascular. And so I went to uh, ballet lessons at a local school, which is in the local social club. And my main memory of that is a really, really strong smell of, of beer. And all the tables were around the edge and we did the class in the middle holding on to um, onto chairs and it felt quite transgressive that as a little girl I was allowed into this very adult um, space um, and I got I, I became quite fascinated by it very quickly I didn't show any particular um, talent for it but I was I was very tenacious and um, I would, I practiced um, a lot and I was always a voracious reader. So I tried to read as much as I could, which was a bit limited because there was no internet then. And so I was dependent on uh, the library van, which came to our village, you know, every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and being a van, it wasn't very big. So, you know, the number of books about ballet and dance was, well, it was a real treat if there was anything. Yeah. Um, and then occasionally my dad would take us, we'd go to a much bigger library where there was a bit more, a little bit more material. And there was a magazine called The Dancing Times, which was really the only dance publication um, at, at, that, at that time. This is kind of late, late 60s, early 70s. And that was a real lifeline because lots of organisations advertised in it and um, that's how I really found out, uh, found out about dance. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, um, as well as ballet, I also did a form of dance which we called national, which needs to be in inverted commas. And um, it was a sort of um, 
it's terrible cultural appropriation. <laughs> um, as we learnt, dances from all over the world, very sort of sanitised versions of them. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, dances from the Balkans, for example, dances from, you know, Spain, Tarantella from Italy, Irish jig, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and in some English folk dances as well. But they were, they were performed in a, we were taught to perform them, I think, in a very sanitized way. And the reason I mention it is that as part of the exams, because you did ex examinations in this, um, you had to do a, a, a kind of scrapbook and I really went to town on this and I would write to the embassies of the various countries and they would send me things like tea towels because that was all they had to send to this kind of wow. enthusiastic young person. And, um, and that got me really interested and aware that dance happened in different places and also that it had a different status in different um, environments and um, in, in different countries. I suppose it expanded my worldview in a very, in a small way and opened my eyes to the fact that dance played different roles in different societies um, than, it, than it did in mine. Um, and I also used to watch um, the, the other uh, students at this dance school, which is very much a local, local school, um, who did what was called Greek, inverted commas again, which was derived from Ruby Jinnah method. So I used to watch people doing Greek and I used to watch them doing inverted commas again, modern, which was kind of a form of jazz. And I think that really started me on watching dance. Mm -hmm. And then when I started doing um, Saturday jobs, uh, I had a bit of money and I would go to these competitive dance festivals. I only competed once myself. I really wasn't a good performer, but I would go and I would watch for days. And I think that really started to hone a critical faculty. I was watching everything from, you know, baby ballet under fives through to people who were 16 or 18. But it, you know, you watch a lot in a day because each thing is only about two or three minutes. So that, I think that was quite, when I look back on it, I think that was quite, um, quite useful really. And then through the Dancing Times, I discovered there was this thing called contemporary dance. And through, I eventually took myself off, earned the money, took myself off and went to um, a one week, I think it was at Easter school at the place. Right. Which is a big eye opener. Mm. Uh, I had my first experience of looking through the round window and seeing Bob Cohan working with LCDT. Going there was a big deal, and London Contemporary Dance Theatre was, I'd never seen them perform, was the contemporary dance company, I'd only seen pictures. Um, but, and Bob Cohan was the artistic director, extremely charismatic, you do have to remember this was the early 70s. <laughs> and um, so that was a real experience going there and just discovering the sheer rigour of Graham technique. And I think the... Um, the perception I had was that ballet was the be all and end all was uh, it was still very important to me but I realized that through this very small exposure that there was another whole world mm -hmm. and that dance was uh, sort of theater dance if you like was was much much bigger than I'd understood it might be mm. And so from there, what, what happened in terms of your career development? You, um, well, I, I mean, at school, they didn't, I went to a grammar school, a very um, science uh, uh, oriented. It, was a, it wasn't a private school. It wasn't, fee, it wasn't fee paying, but they got a lot of people into the well-known universities and that wasn't the route I was going to go. Um, so again, using the Dancing Times, I found out there were other courses and um, I could, at that time, amazingly, you could get a grant to do a degree. It's quite extraordinary to think about that now. And so I found two places. One was the Laban Centre in London, which is now the most beautiful, extraordinary, award-winning building um, in, in Deptford. At that time, it was tucked in um, behind uh, Goldsmiths University. 
so I auditioned there and I also auditioned at Middlesex University, which did a BA in performing arts and the Laban course was, was, was dance solely. And um, I went purely with my instinct um, and I went to Middlesex. Um, and I was there at an extraordinary time and Middlesex was a forerunner in uh, enabling people to do degrees um, who were older. So I was on a campus with a lot of more mature people. You know, everybody was not 18 to 21. And it was the, it was the teach, it was where, where people learned to teach as well. So it's, it, was, it was a very beautiful campus as well in a park. And I was in the third intake of this new degree. And there was huge excitement. The people who were teaching it were very excited by what they were doing because they were basically working out as they went along. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, I specialised in dance, but I had I did drama and music as well. We all had to learn to juggle. That was compulsory. Um, I did a course called Making Three Dimensional Objects um, Out of Found Materials That Are Larger Than Yourself mm -hmm. every Wednesday afternoon for a semester. We would go out into the woods and we'd make big objects. Um, I learned photography, I did creative writing, I did screen printing. Um, you know, it wasn't a place where you would go to be trained to be a professional dancer because you didn't get enough classes. Um, uh, but I did three or four classes a week. I found my way to doing more and I choreographed. And I think it gave me a very, very broad base. Mm. But I wasn't, I was a jack of all trades when I came out, really. But I think the perhaps the single biggest thing was I got used to working with people who'd had different experiences, life experiences to me. It was quite a diverse group in terms of um, age for that time. Um, in terms of cultural background, it was more diverse than a lot of courses, though, you know, not compared to today. Um, and I think that was very, very um, good for me actually and there were the resources to do quite big productions and to be quite ambitious mm. and to take we were actively encouraged to take risks so um for you know an 18 year old from a small village it was eye-opening to say the least in in every way but i think it was very it was a very good experience um uh, for me and actually I think my instinct was was right that that was the right place for me. So then you just immersed yourself in the, the London scene and the rest of history? We were yeah we it was a, like half an hour on the tube into London maybe 25 minutes um, so I immersed myself as much as I could I was I was around London at a formative time it was when um, uh, X6 Dance Collective had started, they just moved to Chisholm Hale Dance Space, which is, is still going and is a real, um, it, it's a real home for independent thinking and independent practice. And I was very fortunate to be around that. Also Dance Umbrella was in its formative years. Sadler's Wells was uh, not what it is now at all. It was the old building, but I saw Pina Bausch there for the first time. Um, the audience was so small, we were all moved down to the stalls. Um, and I went to the Opera House a lot and was in the very cheapest seats where I stood. So I saw, I was able to see a lot and I made it my, my business to see as much as I could. So I was having that proximity to London, I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. And because I had a grant and I could work in the holidays and I had a cleaning job, I was possibly the worst cleaner ever. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I um, was able to afford to do that. And it, I think it's incredibly sad now that it's so very, very difficult for people being educated in the arts to be able to afford to see a lot. Or even to stay in London, I mean, that's... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I was very privileged. I was, you know, it's 20, uh, 1980 to 83, so it was a very different world. Yeah. Um, Teresa, today or this week, we're, we're talking about this theme of leadership, and I want to ask, mm -hmm. how do you recall an occasion in, in your career or your studies where you've learned something valuable about leadership? 
Uh, when I worked at, well, I'd say the first thing was in my first job at Sadler's Wells in the old building was I was their, their first um, community and education officer, mm. as I was called. And then at the South Bank, I was called special projects officer. And both of those, in both of those roles, I was the first person in them. Mm -hmm. And as a very young person, I was trusted to get on with it. I was given guidance and I was given boundaries, but I was given trust as well. And that was very, uh, that was very important. It meant that I could try things out and be experimental and I had to justify what I was doing, but it also meant that I could make mistakes. So I, th I think trust is a very key thing, but it does have to be underpinned by a person feeling that they're being held to some extent. And an example of that, I remember being responsible for um, an international festival at the South Bank Centre, where we brought artists from um, the Indonesian uh, islands about 125 people who wouldn't think of doing that now um and i was looking after it and the person who was my line manager said to me i trust you to do this i'm on my phone you can call me anytime you need to over the weekend and i think that's you know that's that was really valuable learning for me uh, another th another example would be at the place I was working in an organisation that was led by four people, and they didn't agree all the time. They're very different temperamentally, and being and I wasn't part of that group, um, but being around it taught me how rich and how enriching it can be to have a multiplicity of voices mm -hmm. around a table also how it can make decision making frustratingly slow um, but I think that's worth it for the enrichment that you get mm. and that it requires real generosity and a lack of ego on everybody's part and that's when having a clear vision is really important because if ever, and values if everybody deep down shares the values and shares the mission and is pointing the same way you will find a way through even if there there are quite serious um differences of view um effective leadership is also often defined as, as this ability to to bring out the best in people you've described some other qualities that you attribute to good leadership as like trust um is there if you go any deeper are there any other clear attributes that you you think mm -hmm really signify good leadership yeah I, I mean I, I really dislike the word resilience I think it's very overused but I think it's overused for a good reason which is that actually being resilient is key to leadership um, particularly um, in the situation that we find ourselves in now with COVID-19 but also um, because as a as somebody working in any kind of arts or cultural organization you are always competing for funds for audiences etc there will always be disappointments and that will be reflected right the way through your team if your team is 300 people or you know you're a sole trader or you work with one other person as a partnership so i think the resilience to be able to deal with that, to digest it and to learn from it, not to put it in a box and pretend it hasn't happened, is actually an important skill. And I think along with that goes having quite significant stamina, physical and mental <laughs> stamina, because these, you know, it's, it's quite demanding. Um, I think you need to know yourself quite well. Uh, I think you need to be able to listen and to consult, but you have to be, you have to be decisive. At the end of the day, you've got to make clear decisions and convey them clearly. You have, you have to listen to people and you have to hear what they say, but be honest in terms of what you may or may not be able to do with what you say, which is about expectation management. 
uh, I think it's very important to uh, recognize that a good idea can come from anybody. You know, some people are ideas machines. I, I work with an amazing person who I owe so much to, John Ashford, who is now the director of Airwaves and was the director of theatre um, at the place. And he's been a colleague now for, for many, many years. And John is an ideas machine. He's incredibly generative. It's quite extraordinary and, um, and, and quite wonderful. And you have people who are like, who are like John and you also have people who bounce off other people to have ideas and it's more of a layering effect where it's the incremental power of the energy of those ideas coming in and suddenly somebody has the light bulb moment and that's why I think intergenerational teams are really critical. In my first job I was very fortunate my line manager was somebody who had been um, Alan Wood. He had been uh, international director of marketing for Guinness. And when he retired, he worked as what we would now call, I think an executive director probably at Sadler's Wells. So, and I was 21 and there were people of all different ages in between. And it, it was really, the way that we had ideas as a team bringing our different mm. perspectives and thoughts was very valuable and that really really taught me that one can't make assumptions about where a good idea will uh, will come from i think great leaders surround themselves with people who are better at doing things than they are themselves they have that confidence they don't you know you don't have to be good at everything um so that that confidence to really appoint people who will challenge them and disagree with them and who are experts or who have the potential to be experts. That brings me on to something else about leaders is very often they're very, very perceptive about others who have leadership potential. They see it in others. And I think leaders have a responsibility to, to nurture others. And there's a variety of different ways in which, uh, in which they can do that. And you need to know when to move on if you're running an organization. <laughs> And you need to be an ambassador for your own organization, but also for your for the wider um, the wider sector. And I think in a way that is appropriate for your personality to put your head above the parapet mm. occasionally and really stand up for things that you believe in. And I do think there's a lot of different ways of doing that. I don't think you have to be a stand up and make a proclamation kind of leader I think there are different different ways of doing that but finding your way to do it as a leader um, is is important and people grow into leadership at different stages in their development some people will sort of pop out and you think my goodness that person's almost fully formed you know they're only 25 and other people really mature into it yeah in, and in, this, in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we can maybe assume that leadership is going to look very different. Have there been changes already in your thinking and working process? Um, I think it is, I don't know, I've been, I have been um, pondering this. I think the basic principles remain the same. So some of the things I mentioned in response to your last question Nicole um, I think what it is requiring is that leaders have a very full toolbox of skills and ways in which they can work and I think that's very I think that's very demanding of people particularly because inevitably they're dealing with a huge amount of uncertainty as are all the people that they uh, work with um, their peer groups, the people who are in their organisations, um, and it's it's worldwide. Mm. And the extraordinary thing about this is that I think everybody is experiencing some quite similar um, impacts. And I think that in a strange way, there is a, a kind of a comfort and a meeting of minds in that. It is much tougher in some places than um, you know than than others. And again, I would go back to saying that here in the 
here in England, we are um, fortunate in that, that there is some emergency um, funding. So I think in a way, it's all of those leadership skills, but they're all needed at once. Um, so I think that's quite, that's quite hard. On a, on a practical level, there's the need to be able to either do, either do this yourself or to galvanize your teams to do a lot of financial modeling, options modeling, analysis of situations and to be able to respond very quickly to, uh, to change while holding on to the core, you know, your core vision, your mission, why you do what you do and what your values are. And those really become a litmus paper to test the opportunities and the options that come along because there are, there are opportunities, there are opportunities for accelerated thinking, for example, um, in this situation. And there's also time for reflection, which I think is, uh, is valuable, very valuable um, to do as well. It's time to test some new paradigms. But above all, I think it's a time for huge compassion for people. We think about um, dancers, for example, you know, it's been six, seven weeks since people can do a proper class. Getting yourself back from that is going to be physically and emotionally very tough. Yeah. Um, it's really hard for young, for not necessarily young, but for people earlier in their careers who are producers, who are independent artists, who are not in companies. They don't have that, the comfort that that gives them um, financially, perhaps, and also in terms of support. Um, and their work has dried up completely mm -hmm. overnight. Everything has gone. We still have to pay the rent and they still have to eat. And so I think leaders have to look outside their own organisations, have to take a much wider view and make the case for the people who make up the arts, because without the people, there are no arts yeah. in this much wider um, context. Mm -hmm. And that's also about arguing the contribution the arts can make to our humanity, you know, as as human beings, why are the why are the arts important now? And that's not saying other things are not important, but it's saying the arts can make a very real contribution for what they are for their own sake, um, but also make a very real contribution in terms of health, well-being, and that's physical well-being and mental well-being as well. And they do bring joy and the world does need that so I think arguing using the kind of language the kind of examples the kind of evidence this is needed to make arguments for the arts to very different audiences some of which will not want to be receptive at the moment um, is a really key challenge to arts leaders at present because it is it is such an easy target isn't it when it comes to Yes. Yeah, it can be. It, it, it can be. Yeah, yeah. So it's also a time to really empower audiences and um, participants, people who benefit from the arts, um, for them to articulate the value that the arts have for them. That's very powerful. Um, it, can't simply be the arts community arguing for itself and arguing for its own jobs. It has to be much, much, uh, much, much broader, uh, I think, than that. So I, I don't think leadership really looks very different. I think it's that every tool in a leader's toolbox is now necessary. Yeah. They need to be using using them all, and that's a very very tall order because we're all have tendencies and abilities that uh, are more in one direction than in yeah. another. And I think that's why it's terribly important that leaders come together and share and support each other. That's critical because it's 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 a tough time, really tough time to be. Uh, to be in a leadership role mm. and that's across borders that's internationally um, we had the um, spring forward 
festival, which was due to take place in Rakia, um, uh, two weeks ago was was put online and that was fascinating 1400 people came from all over the world over three days and um the conversations were very interesting because the the awful thing about covid19 is it's affecting almost anybody every you know everybody and so there's a whole dialogue about you know, how it's impacting in different places, but also how the arts community can come can come together to come up with ideas, but also can learn from and take comfort from each other's experiences. Was there anything in particular from those conversations that stands out for you as a as a real sort of challenge? Um, I think I think the need. I think uh, action. I mean, Aero Waves itself was due, you know, due to take place um, in Rekia, which is one of the capitals of culture. And that couldn't happen. So the whole thing was, you know, put online and it was different. It wasn't the same thing. Um, so I think there's, I think there is a necessity for action. It's very important to reflect. It's very important to take time to think. But I think it's also important to test ideas, mm. to take action, to work with colleagues, perhaps to work with different colleagues, to really reach out um, internationally to new people, to forge new uh, coalitions mm. and groupings. And there's a lot of thinking to be done. There's a lot of arguments um, to be made. That's absolutely essential. But I think that there's also this is a this is a an amazing space for innovation mm. as well and for innovative thinking and that means that artists and producers uh, enablers have to collaborate together and ways have to be found to pay artists to do that because this is a desperate situation for um, for independent artists yeah. and so ways have to be found for people to be recompensed for their time. Teresa, from your incredible base of knowledge that you have and, and these conversations you're having at the moment, what you're observing that's happening in the sector, is there, or even outside of the sector, is there just one tip you would, you would give for anyone wanting to improve their leadership skills? Um, I think I would, I would say don't be afraid to ask people who you feel are exhibiting leadership skills uh, to have a conversation mm. and to learn to learn from learn from them i think it's worth reaching out many leaders are very generous um, and you know, want to and want to help. So I think that's I think that's a really useful thing to do. Uh, I I also have found Michael Kaiser's work very interesting and uh, and useful. So I think it's that that's something that people might want to uh, to take a look at. And here in the UK, the CLAW Leadership Programme have a lot of very interesting, multifaceted resources on their website, looking at different styles of leadership um, uh, as well. So I'd suggest uh, taking a look at that. Teresa, thank you so much. Showing that, I mean, as a great leader yourself, you know, we were just seeing this demonstration of your incredible insights and, and generosity. So it's been really wonderful to have this conversation and to, to hear your thoughts. And uh, I hope you're staying safe and well there in London. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
Thank you very much, Nicole. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and uh, stay safe. <laughs>